Hello there, I'm Pete Snodden. Welcome to episode three of The Journey. I have been waiting to have this conversation for years, as you'll get to hear. I'm speaking this week to a guy who I really admire, someone who has lived out his dream. He dreamt of being a superstar DJ, and he became a superstar DJ. He took the UK and European dance scene by storm. He played right around the world. He got himself a show on National Radio 1. He had the world at his feet. He changed musical direction a number of times. He had loads of ups and loads of downs along the way. He lost everything. And then he built himself right back up again and got himself to the entertainment capital of the world, Las Vegas, Nevada, where he now lives. This is a longer episode than usual. It's an incredible journey. So strap yourself in. This is the journey of Robert Ferguson from Larne, a.k.a. Fergie DJ. The Journey with Pete Snodden. Okay, Robert Ferguson from Larn, a.k.a. Fergie, a.k.a. Fergie DJ. Um, we're going to talk about your journey, and it's been an incredible journey. You know, I've been waiting to do this interview for, oh, at least 15 years. At least 15 years, maybe more. Wow. That's pretty... Uh... There's a lot of waters going on to the bridge and then 15 years. <laughs> yeah, and the 10 years before that. So you're in Las Vegas, you're in your studio and um, you're making music, which we're going to come on to talk about in a little while. But you know what? The thing which amazes me, because I'm a fan of what you've done in your career, is that there's a, a whole generation of people at home here in Northern Ireland who, who, have, who maybe don't know you, don't know the significance that you played in the dance music scene, don't know that you've conquered Europe and right around the world. You've, you've reinvented yourself numerous amounts of times and you're doing that again right now. So I want to go back. Still to talking, are we still talking about me? Yeah, we're still talking about you. 13 years old and you end up in a nightclub. Um, how does that happen? Because at 13, I was nowhere near a nightclub. Yeah, do you know what? It was uh, one of the... Uh, it was just a, a, a real coincidence, real one-off situation. Um, my mum and dad, they still live in the same house they, my dad was born in, in Lauren. Um, one of his good friends at the time, Michael Collins, when he was, you know, just a kid, uh, lived two doors up. And um, they grew up together. Mike actually became a DJ and started messing around out in my granddad's which was my dad's uh shed out in his back garden just playing old vinyl and they weren't doing any mixing or anything they were just you know he my dad said he would have been playing records and talking and trying to be like a tv host type thing and all this and um he went away for years and years he was djing around europe like scandinavia copenhagen blah 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 and he came home um just to see his mom and dad his mom and dad still lived in the same house and he came down to see my mom and dad and he was actually uh, talking to my mom and dad in the sitting room and they called me down and went and met him and blah, blah, blah. And he uh, jokingly said that he was going to the arena and uh, I'll take Robert with me. And my mom and dad gave me such a, a long leash when I was younger. He wasn't expecting the reply and the reply was, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so... So that, that's what happened, and that journey changed. That journey changed everything for me. You know, it changed my, it changed my whole life. You know, um, for so many reasons. Like from that point on, my life was as incredible fairy tale story with loads of nightmares along the way and i don't know if you remember you used to drive down in the arman instead of stop signs they would have sniper on patrol 
like they would have all the you know and it was it was just every part of the trip was just like it was just getting your your heart racing you know because you didn't know what what was what they expect and then you pull into the the car park of the arena you know and and for anybody that hasn't been to the arena you have to go through these turnstiles like a football an old football ground you know and once you got into the nightclub um the dj which was Mark Dolman at this point, you know, would play like classical music and everybody would come in and he would lie on the floor and look at the ceiling. And I'm 13 years old. Or I don't even think it was 13. I think it was about 12. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, what, what's going on here? You know what I mean? It was completely crazy. I've never seen anything like it in my life. And then Mark Dolman goes on the microphone. He goes, it's the weekend. So he's been saying that that long and he puts on a, a dance track and everybody jumps up and they're all just start going for it, hammers and tongs, you know. So for me, standing, witnessing that, you know, and, and seeing the command that a DJ had, you know, was just, it was mind boggling for me. It was crazy. I remember, you know, the whole journey back, you know, saying to, Michael Collins, um, you know, what, what, what was that? Like, what was the music? And he's like, well, that was house music and this is trance music and that's, uh, sorry, that's me, sorry. Um, and he was explaining all these different uh, styles of music, you know, and I'm trying to get my head around it and trying to figure out all the differences, you know, it was just too much information for me. That night changed your life. It gave you an appreciation of what a DJ was, what a DJ did, if the DJ was good, uh, how you commanded the audience. Um, at that stage, were you, were you a fan of dance music or was that the first part of your education to go and find out what this music was? That was my first bit of education, you know. You know, I was, I was always into music. I wasn't... I wasn't necessarily someone that was going out of my way to listen to music, but my mom had like, I remember old rock anthems, tapes lying around like Dr. Hook and, you know, uh, ABBA and just all these different mishmash of stuff. There's a lot of Freddie Mercury. I love Freddie Mercury. I love Queen. And um, so that's what I was kind of listening to. Not, not through choice, even though I loved it, but it was it was music that was in the house that I I, I gravitated towards that I, I enjoyed. Um, so that, that worked out quite well. I was just a big football guy, you know. I was I I lived it, breathed it. I didn't I didn't have any time for anything else, you know, up until that point. <laughs> so you're going to the record shop, you're getting the tunes, you're listening to DJ mixtapes. And the nightclub in Larne um, was Killwater House. It was. So it tell, was. Us, tell us about you being there. Tell us why you were there. And tell us about the introduction to Tony DeVitt, or as some people would call him, Tony DeVitt. Yeah. Um, I mean, I after that arena experience, you know, obviously then I started hanging around um, Mark Dobbins record store. And funnily enough, I actually got my picture taken outside the uh, record store on its very first day when it opened. It's always spending time with Mark and Glaive and listening to music and not going to school and just spending my time in there. And then um, obviously, you know, I started DJing. My friends started putting on parties. And then um, they opened Cold Water Housing. It was 1994. And they wouldn't let me in. Mark wouldn't let me in. Even though I'd known him really well now, he wouldn't let me in. Uh, he only would let me in if I would take a job there, collecting the glasses and bottles. And that was, uh, Jimmy D would pick me up every Friday and Saturday, take me to work. <laughs> I'm going to have to explain for those people going, who's Cleve, who's Jimmy D, who's Mark? So okay. uh, they're, they're, they're friends of mine. They're friends, uh, they're friends of Fergie's. They're from Larne. And um, they had a nightclub called Killwater House. Mark had the record store. Cleve's his brother. Jimmy D's the dad. And they are just a remarkable family. Remarkable. I mean, they're legendary. There isn't like, <laughs> it's just hard to even put it into words, like what they are as 
people and what they represent. It's just so many different walks of life, you know, from Jimmy to Gleave to Mark. I mean, wow. And a massive all- part, for those of you listening to this who aren't from Northern Ireland, they, they're a bit of a dynasty in terms of the entertainment scene in Northern Ireland. Yeah, totally. You know, Mark um, being um, a DJ for many, many years in Gleave and, you know, Gleave being a, a world champion, a DMC mixing champion at, at the age of 16, you know, and maybe it was 15 actually. And and Jimmy D, you know, Jimmy D uh, is just an all round instrumentalist, you know. Um, for instance, everybody would go back to his house after water house or whatever and jimmy they'd be on the piano playing pearls a singer you know or playing the guitar or and he would have this chest you know in his living room with all these different wigs and beards and hats and everybody would just be there for days on end you, you end up in killwater house eventually and um, when they they finally let you in um you were working there right you were collecting glasses I was working there, yeah. Worked there uh, Friday and Saturday night, nine pound a night I got. And um, it was incredible for me, you know, because 1994, so. So I was 13 then, 1994 when that opened. So um, that was incredible for me to be in there. And I just remember even just working in there and being a 13 year old boy and like seeing all these really sexy girls and just smelling them and walking through the crowd and lifting the glasses and bottles and just being like, what, this is unbelievable. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? And listening to the music and the atmosphere and it was just, you just, uh, I just don't even know how to, explain how that made me feel but you know it stayed with me all these years you know it was so so strong that it just it just kept me on that track of music and DJing as much as I found it hard for a long time and still do that desire and that love of music you know makes you makes you keep going you know what i mean so there's aspects we all do of our job that we don't uh, maybe enjoy as much but for me the music was always paramount you know and and you know i always felt that i delivered it in a in a slightly different way and i, I always wanted to tell my story in that way and that's what's always kind of kept me doing it you know so I want to come on and talk about that performance element of, of DJing. Um, but you met Tony um, at Killwater House, um, superstar DJ in his own right, an amazing producer, a real trailblazer. Um, and and he, he brought you to England and you were young. Uh, just can, can you put it just down in words, how that happened, how he saw your potential, how he passed that with your mom? how you end up in England and then how you started this just unbelievable journey. So basically when Tony got booked to play at Coldwater House, this was the third time he had got booked and I actually wasn't working at Coldwater House at the time. I had taken a residency at the airport in Antrim. So um, you- I'm 15 at this stage and I'm playing at the airport in every Friday and Saturday night in Antrim and that place was so crazy the police wouldn't even go there I'm just trying to paint the picture of how rough it was it was crazy um so I was playing in there Tony had been booked twice before and I wouldn't take a night off to go and see anybody you know what I mean but I had constantly been buying Tony's records blah 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 and um I took a night off to go down and see him and um obviously I was allowed to stand in the DJ booth because um because I knew Mark and Gleave and stuff. And um, every every record Tony played, you know, you'd turn around and I'd be writing it down and trying to talk to him, you know what I mean? And he never said anything to me. He never told me to piss off or anything, you know? He was just always really, really had time. You know what I mean? Not just for me, he had time for everybody. And um, I pestered him his whole set. Afterwards, um, like most clubs and the whole of Ireland, the nightclubs in a hotel setting 
for the most part. So I grabbed his record box and I told him I'll help him up to his room, his records. And I'm in his room with him, chatting away to him. And, you know, he's asked me about myself. And I told him, you know, I'd left school in a bad car crash. And t- I take my T-shirt off. <laughs> I take my T-shirt off and I grab his hand and I go to put it on my chest and go, yeah, I feel my ribs are really out of place. And he pulled his hand away. <laughs> and I, don't, I just thought he was weird at this point, you know what I mean? And, um, you know, I said our goodbyes, blah, blah, blah. I got his number. And Lauren, in the 90s, you're not meeting any gay people. It's not happening. If you're gay, you're certainly not telling anybody. Not in the 90s in Lauren. It's just not something that's happening. So, you know, there, I didn't know anything about any gay people. And Tony wasn't like a real queen or anything like that. He was just a gay man, you know. Um, so I, I didn't know. And um, we never spoke about it for a long time. And he, I would be phoning him maybe three or four times a day for six months. And um, that went on until my mom got her phone bill. And I didn't go down too well. <laughs> down too well. Um, but Tony basically started, when he came over to Northern Ireland, he would have stayed in my mom and dad's house with us and Lauren. And, um, you know, spent time getting to know my mom and dad and all that sort of thing. And, and he said, you know, that's when he invited me over to England. He was like, you know, if you want to come for a week. Um, it was in 96. Um, you know, he would love to take me over. And again, my mom and dad, true to form, you know, they gave me a long leash. And I, they didn't let me go, I would have went anyway. So it didn't really matter. But, you know, they, uh, they let me go. And it was a ceasefire at the time. And when I was meant to come home, um, when I was meant to come home, um, the ceasefire broke. And for English people, they didn't really understand, you know what I mean? A lot of them, it was just kind of normal, everyday living for us back then in the the the, the early 90s, for sure, for our generation. But so he's like, oh, you can't go back there. It's so bad, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's terrible, mate. Terrible, can't be going back there. He's like, you can stay here and I'll look after you, mate. Sweet. So I uh, called my mom, I'm like, I'm not coming back. So there you go. I was having a time in my life. I was, Tony was doing maybe about seven to 10 gigs a week back then. Um, so it was incredible for me, you know, now all these clubs that I've been reading about or hearing Pete Tong talk about in the radio or Danny Rampling or the mix mags, like I had, my room was all, you couldn't even find the door in my room that had all the flyers on it, you know what I mean? So now I'm going to all these clubs with Tony, who at the time was one of the biggest DJs in the world, period, you know? And I'm, I'm in the car, I'm carrying the records. I'm like, let's go, you know, this is, I'm 16. Like, it was just incredible. It was all part of your education. And Tony was your mentor. So you're going through this whole period of time and you're then and DJ booth and you're starting to create your own career you're warming up for Tony at events uh, and clubs and Tony dies so yeah. you know if you give us a, a bit of background in that and at that particular moment in time did you just feel like you know your whole world was falling apart um didn't really think about it like that at all it was just like I mean, you know, Tony died of HIV, so it was a very, it wasn't like he just died, you know, it was a very, 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 uh, very, very hard thing to see, you know. Um, Tony called me on a Tuesday night, he was doing his radio show live on Kiss FM, and uh, in between putting the record on, he called me and he's like, Ferg, uh, I've just found out I am HIV positive. How do you process that? What do you say? Uh, I don't even really know what it what it was, you know. I don't know. And um, he just was like, um, call you back, put the phone down, you know. And um, he called my mom. He called my mom straight away. And because um, I think that he, he called me without thinking 
and he called me. I don't know why he called me, but he called me, and he, he, I think he just called me without thinking. You know, he, he, I, I don't know the answer. I don't know why he called me, but I just think he must have called me without thinking. And then he processed it a little bit and called my mum, and you know, he was talking to my mum, and and my mum called me, and she was explaining to me and blah blah blah, and it was like, you know, I just wanted to go down to London to see him. You know what I mean? It's like. It's crazy. I know he had a big photo shoot the next day and he saw one ahead with the photos and it was just crazy. I mean, he, he, he kept on DJing, you know, like up until the end, he done Miss Money Pennies in Plymouth and collapsed <laughs> his gig. I used to go in the car with him. One of the main things with HIV back then was they never really knew what medicine was what the reaction was going to be. Tony's reaction was that it made his feet uh, feel like he was walking on glass. So I used to sit in the car with him. He'd sit in the, in the back seat with his legs over me and I would rub his calves going to all these gigs. Um, sounds weird, but that's just the way we were getting through it. And he, he still dj you know, sorry, killed himself for two hours and then in the car journey just would absolutely die on the way home, you know. Cut his gigs down tremendously, but then the last one was Miss Money Pennies in Plymouth, where he, he, he collapsed and um, you know he went in the hospital and uh, yeah, he didn't come out. How did you pick yourself up after that? I know a lot of people sort of saw you being so close to him, saw you as the person that was his understudy and went with him to gig after gig after gig for years. They saw you as almost like a, a natural replacement for him and, and, and you sort of filled his shoes for, for a while. What was that like for you and did that sit well with you? Because at the end of the day, you're still a young, aspiring DJ wanting yep. to be a superstar DJ. Yep, yep. So, totally, you know, and people, people have asked me the question in the past and, and people have taken, you know... Um, taking all different types of ways. But, you know, ultimately, um, if Tony hadn't have passed away and, you know, it's all, listen, you have to be a grown up and you have to think about the situation, the way it happened. I am in no way saying that I wish it happened, I guess, but it's the way it happened. And ultimately that whole thing created this mad monster. And, you know, from when we buried Tony, that day, 10th of July, you know, to that's when it started. You know, that 10th of July, Tony's met a boy at God's Kitchen. I had to do his gig that night. His mum and dad were like, you got a boy. You have to do it, you know. So from that point was just, it's crazy, you know. It was just, you know, the whole, then I had to do all, they were like, we want you to do all Tony's bookings. Which was a it was a real head uh melter for me, you know, because like you say, I I want to be a DJ, I want to be this superstar DJ and here I am given this opportunity because my friend had tragically um died um in the most horrible way. Um you know, and I, I have to, you know, pick up this kind of baton and and run with it, which I did want to. I was I was I really wanted to, you know. I mean, I remember the last thing Tony said to me, you know, he gave me a hug in hospital and he was in bed and um it was uh, the last time I seen him actually was when England played Argentina and Beckham got sent off and blah blah blah. And that was the last thing I seen him and he gave me a hug and he was like, you know, I can't believe I'm I'm not gonna be here to see you, you know growing into what you're going to be type thing, you know, and, and that was the last, the last I seen him, you know, at that point I was working as well, um, packing nuts and bolts and um, they called me that next day and I uh, said, you know, Tony's, Tony's dead. Crazy. You were what age at this stage? I was 18. I was... 17, sorry. You're packing nuts and bolts. Your life's been turned upside down. You're in England. 
the guy that brought you there is no longer living um, and you're being asked to do his, his gigs in his memory and you hit the ground running and now a sudden snowball effect happens and over the next five to six years, you become one of the most sought after DJs in the UK. And really? You end up front cover of Mix Mag, DJ Mag, you're the top 100 DJs in the world and it is going at a hurtling pace. And for those of us back here in Northern Ireland, we're watching what's going on with bated breath, thinking, you know, you are living out any aspiring DJ stream. Through that period of time, what was it like for you? Could you believe what was happening? Could you enjoy it? Um, I was enjoying it tremendously um i didn't really know what was happening and to be honest with you um my life as i say from that car journey to the arena my life from that point so many things happened to me quickly um you know from being say i was 12 from going to the arena from everything that happened from then, like the, I was just given all these opportunities, you know, playing at Cold War, working at Cold War, playing at the network, playing at the Flyer and Newton Arts, you know, um, getting all these gigs and then going to England and then what happened to Tony and I'm getting all these gigs off the back of that. And to be honest with you, one of the things that, Looking back, it felt it, it just felt kind of like that's what should be happening to me. I know it sounds maybe a bit up my own arse, but that's not how I mean it. I am saying that from a position of looking back and not really knowing what's going on, but still being such a young guy and, and having, you know, four or five years of unbelievable opportunities happen to him that it just starts to become that you believe that that's what happens to you. And that's probably part of the reason why it kept happening because I was expecting it and I was in them situations and I, and I kind of was very shy person. I'm not like an, an, an extrovert sort of, you know, per se. Yeah. And, we're going to come on to all that when it comes to the performance angle because what you've just said and you had that that feeling that this is the sort of stuff that happens to me. Behind all that, I mean, that was a bit of bravado because behind all that, you in yourself, in your own skin, had your own hang-ups. You had your, you know, you know, fearful at times getting behind the decks and entertaining the crowd. But I just want people who are listening and watching this right now to understand you know, the clubs we're talking about, we're talking about trade, we're talking about God's Kitchen, we're talking about being all over Ibiza and privilege and amnesia and space. And, and, and this, is, this is a boyhood dream. And you are living it out. You're plastered all across dance music publications um, across the world. It's all happening. And, you know, being so young, being thrust into this, even in terms of, of doing your dealings, money, looking after yourself, how did you learn at that age to, to, to do all that? Or did you have someone who came along and, and helped you out? Were you, exploit, were you exploited? Yeah, it was a bit, yeah. Well, it was a lot. You know, the money part for me was easy. You know, if I spent all my money, then I didn't need to worry what I'd done with it. You know what I mean? So that's what happened. Spend it all, you know. It's like everybody says to me, oh, you always look really good. Well, if I look good, Anybody that was with me looked really good because we were all getting, you know what I mean? I was buying all my mates everyone. You know what I mean? Um, How many hangers? What about hangers on? Um, didn't really. I had, I had a kind of... My friends all came from the dance floor. You know what I mean? That's where I met all my, my people. My people became the people that I met after I would DJ and I'd go into the, the dance store and whoever was staying drinking with me, you're signed up, you're my friend. If you're staying up with me for a couple of days then, you're going the distance, we're good. 
get on board. Why don't you move in? Let's go. Oh, yeah, you can drive me. That's a good idea. So we, you know, I had all these cars and stuff. I never passed my driving test till I was 27. Um, but I was never sober, so uh, I needed a driver, you know. But and back, back then, if you want, it's like from, from you know, in 2000, if you want to look at it, you know, from oh, Mix Mag, they give me the front cover. From that point on, you know, then uh, Madonna, Z Jen, uh, David Levy, who the only DJs he managed Madonna, Black Sabbath, and the only DJs he managed was Paul Logan, Full Fat Boy Slim. You know, he's knocking on my door. He's like, I want to do your, I want to, I want to book you. I'm like, okay, cool. So I signed with him at ITB, and then I went down and had a meet with Rudy One. They wanted me to do a, a, a pilot for a show. They're like, uh, you're a really funny guy, um, but you sound as if you have a coat hanger stuck in your mouth, so uh, we're going to pass on the show. A um, couple of weeks later, they hit me up. They're like, uh, we've got a really cool idea. Um, we've never done this before. Uh, would you be interested in being a uh, essential mix resident DJ? By monthly with Carl Cox. I'm like... Why not? <laughs> right? That's crazy. So my first rave that I went to after the arena was Hellraiser, Bomb Scare, uh, 1993. We're all getting kicked out. Everybody's waiting for Carl Cox to come on. And we never thought we were going to get to see him. Then they let everybody else in. It was the first time I seen Carl Cox. You know, it was an amazing experience. So from that point on, you know, Carl was a, a big influence on me. So for that to happen with the Radio 1 thing was incredible it was an incredible coincidence and um that's that was my kind of first real involvement with doing a committed service to radio one you know before that i i, I remember the first time they they used to give out a phone number to select few djs where you could call up pete tong on a friday and go hi pete this is judge jules or boy george and tonight i'm playing at so to get that number was like Oh my God, I've made it. I can't believe it. I'm going to call up. It's like, what? The, the feature was called The Usual Suspects. That's it. The Usual and Suspects. Came on and then it was, hi Pete, Spurgy here. Tonight I'm going to be playing blah de blah I'm going to be doing this, that and the other. Yep. So even doing that, I remember thinking, wow, I've made it now, man. <laughs> yeah, so that that went from that to getting asked to do a hot mix on Pete Tong show. Then Jules got me an essential mix. He got me the essential, the first essential mix, and then um, Matt Priest, who worked at Radio One, um, he he was the one that asked me to do the the uh, residency with Carl Cox. You know what they they were saying to me was because they came to the gigs and scouted me out and whatever, and they're like. We really love the atmosphere you have in the club. You're the only DJ at the time. I was the only DJ at the time that was the same age as the people going to the raves. You know what I mean? Everybody else is maybe 10, 15 years older than me, you know? So they really wanted to have me fill that position, you know, really connect and that demographic. There was nobody else really that could have done it, you know? So that's how that happened. So. I signed on that deal. The same day I signed that deal, I just signed a big deal with Ministry of Sound to do three albums with them, do the uh, the annual and uh, a couple of other mixed compilations. So just that whole week alone with David Levy, Ministry of Sound, Radio One. I mean, that, that's what I'm saying. Like at this point, this stuff was just happening to me. You know, I had Barbara Sharon, who's Keith Richards. Uh, PR, you know, it's chasing me down, wants to be my PR. At the time, I couldn't have paid for any more PR. I was getting so much PR for free. It was unbelievable. What, the only reason why I stopped getting PR is when I took on a PR agent. And all the magazines got pissed off on me. They're like, uh, well, we just call Ferg and do it. And they're like, no, you, you can't do that anymore. And that's when a lot of the resentment started, you know. Part of by, it by, 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 by resentment? What are you? What are you talking about? Well, they always called me the people's DJ, right? You know, DJ the people. Like I was, you know, finished DJ and I'm in the crowd. Like I'm going DJ at house parties. I made Radio One do this whole, you know, uh, where instead of 
do an outside broadcast. We went and done people's houses. Don't even remember this. We've done it five or six times. And it was just incredible, you know. So it was, I had this, the like Robin Hood type vibe going on. And, you know, when I started having to build more of a team, it didn't really, it didn't really work because people, what they liked about me was they connected with me and, and they didn't, I was just Joe off the street, you know, and no wears or graces. And um, they could just call me up and do a photo shoot or whatever. And now they had to go through all these processes. You know, now they're like, well, we're not doing any press because for we want to do a press around this, releasing this single, or, you know, we don't want to do you. We're going to do DJ Mag or we're going to do, you know what I mean? Like, so the, a lot it, of politics. Political. Came. It got political. And, and instead of being political. easy guy to deal with, the people who you surrounded yourself with made it an issue for people to get to you. And in fairness to them, they were thinking they were doing the right thing by you. You were paying them money, so they thought they need to up the ante in terms of making it difficult for people to get to you, so they justify their wage. Totally. And that's all the way it should happen. It, like my situation, nothing really happened how it should happen. So... I, I'm not resentful of the way it happened. You know, I look back and a lot of people say to me, oh, do you wish you had done stuff different? I couldn't have done stuff different. There wasn't, there wasn't a, there wasn't a template for it. I was the first DJ to penetrate the Danny Tanaglias, the Sashes, the Paul Openfalls, the Fatboy Slims. Uh, there was nobody, that golden circle of DJs wasn't, no, you didn't. That was, that was done. You know that you weren't getting in. So, it happened for me. I have no idea how it happened, but it happened, and it was just right in the wave. You know, it was just like you don't like this. I, you know what I mean? I, I you get your you, show Friday Radio One, and you're on after Tim Westwood, <laughs> and you got you got the gig at Radio One. You, you came through that whole essential mix residency style thing you've got your own program right now and what seemed to people on the outside looking in is that suddenly you went from doing everything that you were known for and playing hard house music for the masses to suddenly having this aspiration to be a techno dj so you're on radio one they've given you the gig based on what you're doing in the nightclubs at the time then once when you get the show you come on and do t- something totally different and, and some people will look at that and go, your man's nuts. Mm-hmm. I was. <laughs> but why? No, but, 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 but why, why change what, what, what when, you, when you got to the, to the place where you wanted to get to, you had the national show on BBC Radio 1, and you go, well, yeah, but I've got to do it my way, and I'm now going to change everything that people know me for, and I'm just going to play techno. Because in my mind, I hadn't got the place that I wanted to get to, you know what I mean? Like, um, like I had no... I had no big plans to be on Radio 1. I had no plans for any of this, you know what I mean? Like, first and foremost, I was always only playing the music that I loved, you know what I mean? They gave me a buzz. And from DJing from your 13 years old to 21, playing the same music, most people's careers don't even last that long, so you know, in the limelight like that. So I got the stage and I'll tell you actually what happened. I got voted into DJ Mike. Uh, I was uh, top 100. I was in Ibiza. I think it was number seven or eight or something like that. And I literally took the records out in my record box, at Pikes in Ibiza. And that was the last time I played Hard House. I was like, I'm not playing it anymore. I'm done. I'm done with it. I was craving, yeah. like, I Why? just, I just, I never, I, I, I grew tired with the sound. I grew tired with, having to keep this legacy thing going when I knew in my heart that Tony was always two or three steps ahead of everybody in terms of music and the music at Hard House would become which is faster and faster and faster and faster and faster and it just became so diluted I absolutely hated it I wasn't enjoying it and you know I seen when I got into DJ Mag and the Radio 1 thing started to happen I was like okay this is my this is this is my this is my chance to, you know, play mature a little bit. I, I was craving kind of 
to, to be able to to change my music. I was so sick of what I was doing. It, it just become became a bit kind of stagnant for me. I also get that, you know, this was your big opportunity to step out of Tony's shoes. I totally and utterly get that. So this is for me, I mean, you're on a roller coaster. You've been on a roller coaster from 12 years of age. It's all been happening. You've been going at a hurtling speed. You have loads of hangers on. You're spending every single penny that you're earning. You get the gig at Radio 1. You start playing techno music. You're trying to redefine yourself on a national platform. And the producers are getting cold feet about what you're playing. Um, how was that? And, and then how did it come to be being pushed out the door at Radio 1? Well, from me being on the show 2001 to 2006, so the cold feet was kept, uh, you know, a little bit warmer by the, the radar figures. So that's what kept me in there, you know what I mean? Uh, until a point where uh, 2006, they're like, uh, we, want, uh, we want you to, you've changed so much, is what they said to me. And uh, we don't feel that you're representing the demograph that we brought you here to do. And I'm like, well, I mean, that was, you know, five nearly six years ago so of course it's going to change you know i'm 26 at this point and um they're like can you you know go back to playing like hard house and trance and i you couldn't at that point you know i had like phil kieran was standing in for me on my show dave clark was standing in for me i had sven bath uh richie houghton ben sims like my show would become uh this sort of techno mecca you know and nobody else was playing any music like that on Radio 1. John Peel, God rest his soul, was dipping into it now and again. But my show was so far ahead of its time that um, they just, the, like you say, the producers just wanted to, they just felt that I wasn't getting that age group that they were after, that I had matured out of that sound that they wanted and generally um you know you don't leave radio one you know what i mean um that leaves you, you nobody nobody walks away from radio one you know so ultimately they didn't renew my contract because i wouldn't i couldn't go and play different music i just couldn't it would just be so lose any ounce of credibility that i built up from being on there because i had to work really hard at getting Phil Kieran, Dave Clark, Adam Bear. Like, I had to work so hard getting these guys to appreciate what I was doing because they see me as the Antichrist. They see me as this hard house guy that used to knock about with some gay DJ um, that has been given a show on Radio 1 and I'm trying to ruin their style of music and ruin their whole scene. A lot of them didn't even like the fact that their music was being played on Radio 1. They didn't like it, you know? So it was a whole, it was so hard. It was so, so hard. And, and it took a long time to, to win them over. And, and for me as well, from a monetary aspect, you know, I went from, you know, getting 10 grand for some gigs to not being to play them gigs for two years. Prince and I was playing Colors in Glasgow. I was getting paid so much money, but I couldn't play that gig for two years. I was told by Slam, if I wanted to play their pressure gig. So I couldn't play in Glasgow. I had to not take yeah. that money. Then when I did play, they're like, well, we can only pay you 500 pounds. I'm like, okay, cool. Great. That, people listen to this right now will just say that that makes absolutely no business sense whatsoever. I never started it for a business, mate. You know what I mean? It was never, it was never, there was never any business sense in it. You know what I mean? It wasn't, uh, and I've always said that the whole long, like, um, you know, people say, well, why did you change that? Why did you do that? And blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, to be, as much as I didn't enjoy performing, my, my saving grace was is that if I'm playing a music that I absolutely love, then there's something driving me in there because performing didn't do it for me. I absolutely hated it. I didn't like DJ, I didn't like standing up there and everybody looking at you like you're a fucking magician going to pull rabbits out of a hat and all. And like, I just didn't like it. I'd rather they put a blanket over the DJ booth and just let me carry on. Right, two things on that. 
okay so number one you you got all these these main techno producers and djs to to present your radio show to respect you all right to to bring you into that techno scene as you said you were the antichrist so for being able to achieve that how proud are you of yourself to be able that you actually did that it was a big thing because what people don't realize was you know i went through a massive bankruptcy and uh this was all happening as a radio one you know i had just bought this house, million pound house in Stratford upon Avon. And, um, you know, uh, my manager at the time, all my money from Radio One was getting paid into him. Never seen it for years. Didn't see any of it. <laughs> you know what I mean? So when people say to me, oh, business, I wasn't looking at it as business being, I was just doing, playing the music. The music was the thing for me. It was the music. It wasn't the performance. It wasn't all the rest of it. It was the music, you know what I mean? Um, so I went through the whole bankruptcy thing that took like six years and I don't know if you're aware but if you're on BBC and you don't pay your TV license you'll get the sack yeah. so imagine having I, I got given this uh, tax bill there was that many digits on it I'm not joking I called my mum from Stratford upon even and I told her what it said she said I think you're in trouble <laughs> yeah Wow. So I remember, telling, I remember telling the BBC, they were like, oh, wish you hadn't told us this. Um, and they, they should have sacked me for it, you know. Um, and that was in 2003. And I never left there until 2006. So whether they weren't agreeing with the music or whatever, they loved me. And they were doing everything they could to keep me there. And, and they, they wish I was playing different music, but I wasn't. But they loved me, you know what I mean? And, and that's... They, I had a great relationship with them all and, and there's so many scenarios why they should have sacked me, you know. Um, but I just to finish on that, you know, I remember sitting, uh, moving from Stratford to, to Hamilton. I couldn't even move to Glasgow because we hadn't got enough money to live there. I remember sitting counting ones and twos and going down to Asda to buy a sausage roll, mate. You know what I mean? It was, it wasn't, it wasn't good. It was, uh, it was crazy. And how, how, how did you deal with that mentally? I have no idea, mate. You know what I mean? I have no idea. It was, you know, at the time, I think probably when I was setting up my my um, eccentric music label and stuff and trying to release music, you know, obviously must have got me through, you know. But for someone that was 26 years old to come away from Radio 1, that was like, people normally are leave Radio 1 when they're in a coffin, you know what I mean? So I remember having a, a conversation with Andy Parfitt and Ian Parkinson, you know, saying to them, well, how is this going to be put out there? Because I'm 26 when somebody normally leaves, like their career's over. But for the outside world, this is going to look like, oh, Fergie's crap now, you know? So they, they went about it like they've never, they, they said, and they've never said it before and they've never said it again. They said, by mutual consent, we have decided to part ways. And they have never said that. Radio One is such a big, I mean, it's the be all and end all, right? So for them to change their stance and change their ego, if I can say that, to, to be there for me and appreciate me and my age and what it could have done to me was incredible. You know, then they, they still give me essential mixes. My last show, they said to me, we're going to give you Pete Tong's show. We're going to give you an essential mix and we're going to do your own show. There's six hours you can have. Where do you want to do it? I'm like, God, take it back home, man. And I, I done my first radio show from Lauren. I done my last one from Lush. There's so much in that. Um, this is a movie. We sat, we sat in Caesar's Palace about three years ago and I said to you, there's a movie in your... In, uh, <laughs> career and, and hopefully for those of you watching and listening to this right now you're starting to see this is that you, you've just had the most amazing amazing story and we're going to get to the phoenix from the flames element of it very very shortly I, mean, I haven't even told you about when i got suspended from radio one yet listen the 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 element which which i find really difficult to understand is that 
At 12 years of old, you go to a nightclub, you see the DJ, you see that the respect and the control that the DJ has over a room. You aspire to be the DJ. You become the DJ. You don't become the DJ. You become the superstar DJ. You have, you go partying with the people who are in the room after you finish. You've loads of hangers on. You lose all your money. But the actual performance element, yes, you love the music. But for me, growing up wanting to be a DJ, it was about playing in front of the crowd. And yes, you had the nerves before you got up and before you did it because you wanted it to go so well. But I know that through all those years, Radio 1, all the clubs right across the world, from the cover of Mix Mag magazine, you had nerves that were so consuming that it would almost stop you playing every gig. Totally. I mean, even every Thursday night, I made, I've, I've just got plastered, like black eye plastered. You know, because I knew I was doing my radio show. If I was recording it on a Friday morning, I was dreading it. I hated like that aspect of it. I loved what I was doing, but I didn't. I could never. I never enjoyed sitting there and having to do that. I enjoyed the bit where you take the record out, they put the record on, press play, music's playing. That's my. That's pure bliss to me. The rest of it. Not for me. You know, I was so bad doing the radio, they stopped even giving me a script. You know what I mean? They're like, well, it's guy saying it's like fucking, oh, hello, I'm Bungie on Radio One. <laughs> Did you feel the need yourself personally that you had to medicate yourself with alcohol or whatever just to get the job done? Um, I felt that I was, uh, I, well, I knew that, you know, I was a different person when I drank. You know what I mean? Like, when I drank, and that's probably why I didn't come across at the show that I was like really nervous because, you know, I probably sounded like uh, I was having such an amazing time too that I didn't really, like I was just, uh, not that I didn't care, but I was just like a bit of a rascal, you know what I mean? Like whatever, um, just having the time of my life type thing. But that's what kind of alcohol done for me. It just kind of, give me the madness, you know what I mean? I like the madness, you know what I mean? I like just, you know, and I just, when I have a drink, I get so excited, so excited. And that's why I can't drink now. I just, cause I'm like, I'm scared. It's like, cause I get so excited really, really quick. It's like, I've gone through my life thinking, how many beers can I drink? Okay, four beers before I get too excited. And I can do that tonight. I can have four beers, then tomorrow night, if I'm not as tired as I was the night before and I have four beers, I'm like, I have more energy. And then I might get drunker or I might be like, oh, well, it was okay last night. I'll have a wee shot. Woo, have a shot. And then, woo. Then the next thing you know, I've got no shoes on, no shirt on. I'm swinging off the chandelier and Omnia and I'm jumping in the crowd. No, man. It, goes, it just goes mad. So, so your, your relationship with alcohol now is what? You're clean? Yeah, clean. I've been clean for the last couple of years. <laughs> I've, oh, I've been on and off for years. How did you get yourself off it? Um, I went to the Priory. Uh, never told anybody else, actually. Went to the Priory because I, I was just worried, you know. I was worried. Um, I went to the Priory. I wanted to stop, you know. And um, she, I only had the, the half an hour consultation that was changed, changed so many things for me. She said to me, you know, after I told her a brief story, about me drinking for all these years. And she said, you know, uh, you've been, you, you've been drinking, um, you've been drinking so long, you know, um, to give you confidence. And she said, you know, it's alcohol is actually taking your confidence away. Cause now you, you, you feel you need alcohol. And that, that just made the hair stick up in the back of my neck. And I never drunk for three years after that. Then so stop smoking, stop drinking, stop everything. Just like that. Done. I didn't like the fact that it really alarmed me. I never had it said to me in that way, and I didn't. Um, I didn't. I didn't like it. I didn't. Didn't, didn't work for me. That. So this is the phoenix from the flames part. So you've had everything. You've had the world at your feet. Um, you are the superstar DJ, the superstar DJ. Yep. You're not. In Hamilton, Scotland, you've, as, as my mother would say, 
um, from old school money in Northern Ireland, you wouldn't have 2 would your name. <laughs> then new Fergie was born. Fergie DJ was born. And you end up in America. Now, for those of you who don't know the backstory, you were heavily involved with God's Kitchen. I remember sitting in Amnesia Nightclub with you in 2004, maybe. Yeah. A man who ran God's Kitchen at the time um, came up with this Hakkasan brand and went to America. And I remember piecing this all together. That's on silent. Well, I don't know why it's ringing. Is that? Why did that do that? Sorry. Don't worry. Don't worry. Um, I remember being on holidays in America and buying GQ magazine, the American version of GQ. And you know the gentleman I'm talking about? You're going to give me his name in a second. He was one of GQ's men of the year. Yeah. Certainly was. And the gentleman I'm talking about is? Lee Moffat. Lee Moffat. Prophet re- Moffat, as I like to I call remember him. Being, I remember being in Amnesia at that time. He was running God's Kitchen, and he was there. And suddenly he had this brand, Hakkasan. He took it to America. He's now taken over Vegas. And then Robert Ferguson from Larn, superstar DJ, who had been there, done that, got the t-shirt, lost a lot, is going to reinvent himself in Vegas. How the heck did that come about? So basically, you know, I was playing at God's Kitchen when, before uh, Neil got involved. Neil approached me because he was going to buy it. And I was 18 at the time. And he was like, we need you to be on board with this. And he met me at TGI Fridays in Coventry, him and James Allgate. And he tried to get me to sign this crazy contract that would be like, uh, I wasn't allowed to play any clubs within 150 mile radius, which was crazy back in the 90s because you're playing everywhere. You just was, you just played everywhere. Um, so they offered me a bit more money and I signed it. <laughs> 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 but um, so I really was a part of the build up of their brand and, and they wanted me because I was a part of the brand anyway from the Tony days and uh, that whole kind of era and um i just became really friendly with them you know to a point where you know uh when neil came to america um we we done some god's kitchen gigs it was the first god's kitchen gigs and um he kept coming back to america i didn't want to go back that much because you know it was at the time where the American government were really scared of this rave culture coming over from the UK and they would, you would go to a gig and they would cancel it. The fire marshal had incredible uh, laws that they could just go in and close a venue. And, and there was a whole kind of, a lot of promoters in America getting put in jail. If there was any drugs being sold in your venue, the, the promoter was going to jail for it straight away. So it was very hard for stuff to happen. Neil seen a, a gap in the market in Vegas and he created bottle service that was his main thing. Like at that point you could go and sit, like in any bar, you go into a bar or nightclub, you see a table, first come, first serve, go and sit on it. You know what I mean? Bottle service. You send your meat up to the bar to get a bottle, right? So he created this whole kind of, you want to buy a bottle of vodka? 50, 50 pounds for a bottle of vodka? Now it's going to cost you five grand. How's that? Oh, yeah, great. Stick a couple of spark washers in it. Great. <laughs> so, so, he, you know, he, 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 he kind of had asked me, you know, when I was um, really one, I should come over, you know, it's, it's beginning to happen here. And I, I was in my element playing techno, trying to make that work. And I'm like, yeah, there's no way I can leave this and go and play Rihanna and, Beyonce and do all that side of things. I just can't do it. And um, I came overseas in 2010. And my work had really started to dry up because I got the ceiling in the techno where I could only go so far. Like I was playing all the all the mid techno clubs, if you like, um, around the world. I couldn't get out of that, you know. Um, like I was playing the biggest ones in Glasgow and in Belfast, like Shine, and, and but that's because I had, I knew them guys, but I couldn't break outside the the the, the mid level clubs apart from that or on a world 
stage, you, you know. What that was? Just because of my past, you know, it was just like, well, you know, it was such a small niche thing. I was like, a lot of them just didn't want me. They didn't want me there, you know, they didn't want me being a part of it. Earlier, you tell me that you had this innermost sort of feeling that it was all laid out for you. This was what you were meant to be doing. Suddenly, you're up against it. Suddenly, you're not getting the gigs that you that you thought that were just going to come your way. So how tough was that? And, and how did you cope with it? Well, I was starting to figure out what work was like. <laughs> no, it was mentally really hard because I was making music and techno guys were playing my music, but if I sent them a reaction sheet, they, were, they would not put their name to saying it was good. They wow. wouldn't put their name to it. They wouldn't say, they wouldn't be letting me take that information and put that out, you know, at all. It was crazy, you know, um, and that was, it was hard, but it, it I just kept doing what I was doing, mate, you know, and I was just making the music and I was so excited about it. Um, you know, I was so dedicated to it, you know, that I was living in Scotland at the time and I, um, you know, even my girlfriend at the time, you know, I was uh, gigging most weekends and then uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I was going down to Portsmouth to be in the studio every week. For seven years I've done that. And um, so it was really dedicated to building the brand, building eccentric music. And then I had all three labels, which later became like Coxie and Bayer, like all these guys that were like, yeah, this is label of the year, uh, Tribal Rage, Eccentric and Reckless was one of my labels. So it was really, really hard. And um, I never really, I never, I never came, I never had that, heyday back again you know what I mean I never never got that level of what it was and I think that's for a few reasons because that level that wasn't there anymore either do you know what I mean it wasn't just the it wasn't there for anybody that thing anymore it changed you know if you look at what was happening on radio stations around 2003 2004 there wasn't even much dance music being played you know, there wasn't on daytime radio. So you're, you you decide you go and you you give it a go in America. And you were going to have to do the Rihanna thing. You were going to have to reinvent yourself again. So you, you go from Hard House Fergie to Techno Fergie. And now you're having to, to go and, and rebuild again. And you were, you were in the top 10 DJs in the world. You were the superstar DJ. You're now in Vegas. And the new thing had arrived, which with... Mr. Moffat's help, bottle service, really yep. swanky clubs. The, the dark, dingy nightclub was gone. It was all about production. There's the David Geddes and the Calvin Harris's, and there's all this. You're DJing on the bill with all these guys. And, and these guys, in their form, had exactly what you had 15 years before, except yep. for there was even more money, and there was even yep. more production. And, yep. and, and was there a part of you being the warm-up guy who resented a little bit that it wasn't you who was obviously yes you were headlining Omni and whatever but was there a little bit of you thinking my goodness that that Calvin Harris singer that David Guetta thing if I had played my cards a bit differently with the music could it be me no no never at all I I um my main thing on my mind coming here was um would I be able to do it? It was the main thing for me. You know, it was a totally different music. You know, I, that's why I came here and changed my name. My name was Rob Casson for the first year because I didn't know if I was going to stay. Um, Neil got me my first gig. It was with Dead Mouse on New Year's Eve at Pier 56 in New York. And I'm playing this music for the first time. Like, uh, and I was like, yeah, I like this. I like this. It kind of took me back to the stuff I was playing was kind of reminiscent of early hard house stuff. It had that kind of bouncy but commercial kind of feel to it, you know. So that's what I could. That's what I related to, and that's what 
put a smile on my face and I wasn't thinking I was setting the world on fire with the music, but I really had to look at it in a different way. And, and it dawned on me when I went to EDC, the first one that happened in Vegas. And I remember standing, looking over the railings, looking at everybody coming in with their furry boots and, and, and all the rest of it. And that's when it dawned on me and I'm like, okay, so I'm playing the grassroots people here. I am playing to me 20 years ago. That's, that's, that's what I'm doing. These people, this is their first time. This is what they're hearing. This is their, their first education within the scene. This is their hellraiser. This is their arena. Do you know what I mean? And that's what I, that just gave me an incredible sense, I guess, of uh, me being like, this person with all this musical knowledge like that's that's what i took out of it and total being a dj from a different perspective than i'd ever thought of it before you know i i when i came here that's when i actually started thinking of myself as being a dj i learned so much from being here more than i ever learned anywhere else because i had so to change so much you're not in the bill at hakasan omnia these are just state-of-the-art nightclubs, state-of-the-art sound, lighting. You're in the entertainment capital of the world. You've now reinvented yourself for what the third or fourth time. Um, and you're making a few quid. Doing and, all right. Yeah, yeah, you're doing all right. But I tell you what, it's hard work. Talk us through, talk us through, obviously we're in lockdown now and, you know, the, the club saying we don't know what that's going to look like on the other side of this. But up to the point of lockdown, talk us through your normal week. Um, so, you know, uh, I got a contract, 250 gigs a year. You know, work it out. It's a lot of gigs. That was just in Vegas. So obviously I had my other stuff around the world that I had really cut down a lot. Um, and that was one of my main... Um, reasons for coming here because as my techno career was kind of dwindling in the UK and on a world stage I was still able to do gigs but I was playing a, every hole in the hedge I was maybe doing 15 to 20 flights a month but it was like five flights to Bulgaria and you have to get you know what I mean it was like it was going down that road and I'm like no this is like not good so that was part of the reason why I was like okay I need to try and do something else and um so i cut that away down and, and when i got given the contract here you know 250 gigs um didn't really let you have any time to do much other stuff you know so it gave me time just to really stay in one place and focus and and um just really concentrate i had no idea what i was doing it was so horrible for the first um probably took me a couple of years to get used to it, to be honest with you. Um, you know, how do you even present a set? You know, what's ingrained in us, as you know yourself, you build a set up, you know, you are building it like your set is the last bits that here we go. But that's what they want from your first record here. And it was mind boggling to me. It was mind boggling to me to keep that enthusiasm for me personally playing my favorite record first my you know what i mean and, and go about it the other way it was so weird it was so weird and so hard and you're playing so many different styles of music you're playing records for two minutes maybe and um you you have to play stuff that everybody knows but you can't burn the atmosphere. No one's going to keep their hands up in the air for your whole set. You need to really understand your audience and you really need to play to a room like you've never done before. For so many years, if anybody's in a nightclub, they're coming to hear Fergie, they know what I'm going to play. Or if I'm going to play in a, a, a festival in a, a, a hard house arena, they're there for a hard house. 10,000 people, they're there for a hard house. You play hard house music, happy days, job done. In Vegas, everybody's there for different reasons. Some people are there because uh, 
they've heard about Hakkasan. They don't even like EDM, but they, they want to go to Hakkasan. There's people there that want to spend a million bucks and have girls. There's people that are there that uh, want to hear Hispanic music. There's people there that want to hear hip hop music. There's people there that just want to hear like, you know, your Bon Jovi's and stuff like that. And there's people there that want to hear EDM. That's my wife looking at me. Get a breakfast on. <laughs> <laughs> there's, um, you know, so there's a multitude of different and a melting pot of different styles going on. And for us, we understand what gets everybody's hands in the air, right? But that's the same for every different group, right? They have their favorite song. And what the promoters don't understand is they want to have this sense of unison in the nightclub and everybody cheering and blah, 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 blah. But they don't understand that the work that goes into getting everybody segregated, different personalities, different uh, ethical, ethical groups, you know, how you have to build them into being one. Do you know what I mean? Like you have to build that. It just doesn't happen. You know, so they don't really appreciate or understand how how you cultivate that. You know what I mean? Um, and that's where you earn your money. Two hundred that, and fifty. That, that, that's where you earn your money. You know, that's where you earn your money. You know, my job was at Hakkasan not to bring people into the club. My job was to keep the people in the club. You know, so even being discussing that with Neil and. You know, my first headline set, I had, I had six booked. After my first one, they cancelled all the other five. Wow. You know, the, that's how harsh how, he was. How, I mean. how, did you, how did you pull it back? How did you turn it around? So just to give you the story, so I was going to all the gigs when Hakkasan opened, Calvin, Tiesto, Aoki, uh, Hardwell, like all the guys, and I'm like, okay, I'm standing up in the balcony, I'm watching the dance floor, because I'm trying to understand this music. Okay, that worked, that worked, that worked. And his set, this worked. And his set, I'll take that, I'll maybe do this, but oh, okay. So in my head, I've got all the biggest songs from all these other DJs. It's going to be easy, right? But what I didn't realize was there's a different crowd to go to see Calvin. There's a different crowd to go to see TSO. There's a different crowd to go to see Steve Aoki. And there's a different crowd to go to see Hardwell, right? Mix that with all the people that are just on the strip and want to go on a night out. But people who are buying tickets. So I want to take a little bit of their set and um, present it, you know, as mine, which sounds great. What I didn't realize was, or what I forgot was, you know, when you're such a, a superstar DJ like TSO, you can play whatever you want. Everybody's going to cheer. I've had it myself years and years ago. You know what I mean? Your crowd, your followers trust you, right? But then... We Fergie from Boyne Square goes on. Nobody knows who he is. The people that work in the club don't even know who he is. And I'm playing these songs, and there's no there's no trust in me. You know what I mean? It's just like, what's this guy doing? This music's really hard, you know. And um, what I I needed to do was I needed to play even more commercial than what them guys were doing because they were selling tickets off their name. I was a nobody in their eyes and I was playing paying playing to people that were even more grassroots people than who were going to see Tiesto and all these guys. Like I was playing to the people that had just heard EDM on the radio for the first time. So my set should have been all radio stuff. Like not every five records of radio track and the rest all EDM from Beatport. Mine should have all been radio stuff and yeah i didn't know that i didn't understand that you know when neil said to me you know uh your set didn't work mate and i i was devastated you know i'm like everybody in the dance floor was loving it he said well we don't really just worry about people on the dance floor with the tables you know to worry about you know if if, if the big spenders are not enjoying it then you know um then everybody's not enjoying it. You know, people that are on the dance floor are, uh, sadly, they're not buying drinks because they're on the dance floor. So uh, your sets are cancelled. 
and you said that the people who were in the club were like, you know, you're a nobody, but in your head, you you were someone. You were a superstar DJ. You were in the front cover of Mixmag. You had it all going. You had the world at your feet. And now you have to rebuild it. I admire you wholeheartedly for what for what you went on to do, and that was to make it work in Vegas. I mean, there was times you'd be DJing, and Kanye West and Kim Kardashian would be in the booth right behind the DJ box. Yeah? Yep. What, 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 what was that like for you, or are you just like, yeah, whatever? What, would I, what was I thinking when I'd done that specific night? I was like, I hope they don't come ask me to play any hip-hop. That's what I'm thinking. Because... Not out of being arrogant or anything like that. It wasn't like, don't ask me to play hip-hop. Just so as I can get this point across. I love it when people ask me for requests. If you're on the dance floor and you want to hand me your phone and, and, and ask me to play a song, if I have it and it's going to work on my set, I can gladly play it. If I had 20 people ask me for 20 songs, I would play it. That to me is like... Someone that's so passionate, they want to hear their song on the dance floor, they're having a great time. Yes, I'll play it. You know what I mean? But when, when my reference to the DJ in that night, I was like, oh, they don't ask me. Because I didn't know the names of any hip-hop songs. Like, you could say to me, can you play? I don't, I don't know. I'd be like... <laughs> I might have it. If you want to hum it to me, I might be able to find it, but like I've no, uh, no idea. I've got Bolivian Angel for you, Robbie Nelson. You want that? El Nino or something? No. <laughs> no, I mean, so you're, it wasn't that I didn't want to play it. I just didn't want to. Didn't want to. I I wouldn't have known if if I had it. I might have had it as a mashup, but I couldn't. Have. That's what I'm thinking. Like when I was th- that night, for sure. Yep. You, you've come from being a 12-year-old in Larne. You've conquered the world of dance music. You've been in national radio. You won the Lost the Light in front of America. You, um, you, you, you got to reside in America. And um, you're, now, you're now writing music. Um, the thing which, which, which I find really intriguing was that whilst you're in Vegas and whilst you live there and whilst you're doing 250 gigs a year, you took yourself to college. Did yeah, unbelievable experience. Wow, I find it so hard learning stuff, man. It freaks me out. It's so frustrating, you know. It's like reading. Uh, my reading's got better, a lot better. But you know, I would be reading things maybe. I'd have to read it maybe ten times a page. Ask me what I just read. Couldn't tell you. No idea. Should go to college. You go to the college. What 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 took you there? What made you decide that after all these years? I mean, you left Northern Ireland. You just ditched school. You went and lived out a dream, um, and now you've decided you're going to take yourself back to education. Why? Well, because I I had always made music. Music is my life. You know, music is my life. You know that one, right? Um, so. I, I'd always made a lot of music and I'd always been in a studio with a, a, an engineer. I always had to convey my ideas. And, um, you know, when I came here, you know, I had to sell this here whole thing for a lot of reasons to myself. And that was one of the things being settled, being here, being able to work on music and do a lot of stuff like that. And that was part of it. And I went to college and I, I loved it. I couldn't really tell you anything that I learned in there, but I just, I, I loved, um, being in the in the classroom, which was really strange for me, considering I spent most of my time at school outside the classroom, you know. But I, I enjoyed being in the classroom, you know. Uh, I had to pay attention. You can just talk to people, you know. It was really small classes, and it was something I was interested in. Was 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 music, you know. And um, yeah, that's what kept me going. You know, it was, it was great. I couldn't tell you anything that I learned there, like. <laughs> <laughs> and and you got on well with your tutor so much so that you guys are now making music together. Yep. Uh he he just said a really good way of uh uh a good way of himself and what happened for me was you know he started singing and making beats on the fly and it was like it it, it kind of had an old sound to it, you know. And um after I left class because I never told anybody what I was doing or 
who I might have been or who I might have, you know, whatever. And I, I, I sent him a message on Instagram and I was like, oh, you know, I've got some cool vintage sense and, um, you know, because we came around the studio and we could maybe jam and do some stuff. And then he came around and we got talking and um, he was like, oh, I can't believe it's you. You know, I came to see you at Omnia and stuff. And I was like, all right, cool, great. I'll come to you. <laughs> So what 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 are you guys making? What do you call yourselves? What's this project? Uh, Where are you uh, hoping that we are the Sonic Social Club? Which is <laughs> nothing social about me at all. But yeah, that's the name. The Sonic Social Club. It's it, we just we wanted to make music when we started off. We're like, what do we want to do? Well, we don't want to make music for the nightclub. You know, I've spent all my life in nightclubs. I want to do something a little bit different. I want to work with vocals. I want to, you know, I just started writing these lyrics. You know, I've written all the lyrics for all our songs. Josh has a bit of input in that. He's normally a lyricist and a vocalist. So our roles have totally reversed. I would normally be laying down the music or saying what music I want, but it's been, he's been, dab on with the music and I've been like sitting and just coming up with these lyrics and you know really in depth telling them how I want it to be sung, the bounce on it, like the delivery and everything like that. Obviously he has to change a lot of stuff because the way I write, I write like a, a wee guy from Northern Ireland. You're going to have to you're going to have to tell me how that uh, how I'm not saying this because I'm just not the words that you're saying and, and, and how I like the delivery you know so it's like the way I write music would probably be really suited to writing country music. There's a big market there in Nashville. You could be music for a fourth or fifth time. Yeah, it just, honestly, it just comes out of me. Honestly, it might sound strange, but when we come in the studio, we have to make a conscious decision not to turn the stuff on because we'll, we'll write a song like, no problem it's like we're in here last night and we're like we're really struggling with how we are like we both feel the same about instagram and social media and stuff like that and we're really struggling with it and we're like oh how do we how do we do this you know like how do we how do we how do we be real like how do we put our real self on instagram how do we do it you know, because as soon as you re put record on your phone, it's it's different. You know what I mean? It's different. It's if someone was following me round with a camera, and I didn't know, it would be amazing. It'd be hilarious. It'd be so funny, and it would just be great crack. But when the record goes on, you know, and I'm like. It just makes me feel like, okay, right, now I'm, um, hi guys, this is me and we're just making a song and I hope you really like it. Yay. <laughs> that sounds awful to me, I hate it. My wife gets so frustrated when me, she's like, you're just overthinking it, you know what I mean? I'm like, well, it just sounds weird to me. I've not been, I've been on social media once since this whole, as soon as I played on the 12th of March, 13th of March, like clubs are closed to me, right? So uh, Instagram, boom, delete, gone. And again, that goes back to that, you know, whether it's on Instagram or whether it's standing in a DJ booth and having that, that nervousness about, about performance. Tell me this, how do you deal with being in the entertainment capital of the world where everything is there and all that temptation you live there and you're clean How do you get um, my wife took my wedding ring off me pretty soon after uh, we got married <laughs> you know when we when we first got together because we met and um, we just hit it off it was like wow this is incredible so I was kind of drinking a little bit and, and when I was going around to stay at her place you know we're having a wee glass of wine in the bedroom, you know what I mean, you know how that goes, and um, we tried to watch Peaky Blinders about three times, man, and we just, we we're just getting amongst it all the time, we just couldn't watch it, so anyway, we're drinking wine, drinking wine, then that leads in, you're going for dinners and stuff, and you're drinking more wine, and then we're like, you know, getting married, and then 
were in their honeymoon and they had met, so just building over. And, um, one of the last times I drank, I know that um, it was it was just in bad shape. They're like, maybe you shouldn't play today. And um, you know, well, he was like, listen, give me your wedding ring. She took my wedding ring off me. She's like, you need to. I'm not going down. This is not how it's going down, man. I'm not marrying into this. And it was a very hard, um, very hard, but a very kind of welcoming feeling. Your story, your journey, is like a movie. I, I don't know whether you, you feel that yourself. It's certainly how I feel when I listen to you. I, I know that you have huge amounts of passion for what you do. Otherwise, it never would have happened, albeit that you think a lot of it was perhaps luck or you thought positively that it was going to happen and it just happened. We're now in a situation where we don't know where club culture is going to go on the other side of coronavirus. You're writing this new music. We're going to finish off the podcast with, with, your, with, with the first single. Um, but, but, but your hopes, dreams and aspirations have changed over the years from you were 12 years of age. What are you hoping that it's going to go to next? So we've sold our house. This is our dream house we built. You know, we've been in it 18 months. So we've, we we decided we had a, we, you know, my wife works in the entertainment industry as well. So we got, we got hit incredibly hard. Um, but we, we decided, you know, I, I had never had this amount of time off from work in my life ever. I'm sure a lot of people haven't. But for me, being outside the nightclub for this amount of time, and I and, and and I hope that people don't take this the wrong way, and I honestly feel for people that have lost loved ones and financially and businesses have gone to pot and it's been turmoil for everybody, and it has for us as well. But it's been pure bliss for me as well, you know, and I have had time to sit and think about what it is that I want to do. Do I enjoy DJing? Love an aspect of it. Do I want to go and have to DJ that amount of times again? No, I won't. Okay, so what? how do I change my life to make that happen? Um, we decided we have sold everything. Like we are such on the same level and it's been building into this for the last couple of years. You know, even with our eating, you know, we the only meat that we eat is meat that we go and hunt and kill ourselves. I mean, we, we're we not, you know what I mean? Like, our whole life has been building up to this, it seems, for us. You know, she's been selling handbags. She's been getting rid of all that stuff. Like, she walks around the house with spacers in between her toes because she likes going running, and that's her mindset. She's not putting Christian to put on shoes on or Louis Vuitton or anything like that. Like, it's totally gone for her, totally changed. So we're like... Let's sell a house. Um, so long answer to your story as we've sold this place. I'm going to live in a trailer park in Vegas for a month. I want to really go and do that. I want to just be there with my laptop. I've sold all my studio. I want to go from hero to nothing. Like I want to just be in there. She's going to stay. My friend has a place at the Waldorf Astoria. Like, couple million she's i i want to be in this car this caravan like and do my thing and i'm going to live there for a month and make music and um just be with myself you know what i mean and then uh we're going to colorado where her family are from we'll stay in the mountains and uh yeah i mean my dream i want to buy an airstream mate and drive around america in it and live in it that's what i want to do you know, and if I get a gig, then I'll take a gig. You know, I, I, it's important that for people to understand that I'm not doing this because uh, I'm fine, I'm good, money's I'm good for that. We're all good there. I'm doing this because it's an opportunity for me, and it's I I need to do this for myself. You know what I mean? I need to take myself outside that situation, and I, and 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 I just have so much music in me. I need to get it out of my head and heart and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, 
let's say vinyl, we don't do vinyl, but I need to get it out of here and, and have it out there. You know what I mean? It's like, it kind of feels like all the stuff I've done in the past, and it sounds really cheesy, but all of it is like, it makes so much sense to me right now. It's like all that stuff makes so much sense to where I'm at right now. Like with all of it is like, ah, uh, okay, right. Yes, I get it. <laughs> People think I'm going mad. I'm not. Being simplistic in everything that we do moving forward is the name of the game. It's like, I've met the woman of my dreams. It's like, we are so unbelievably connected. It's unbelievable. We're two totally different people. Chalk and cheese. Our first date, for instance, she's talking about atoms and particles. I'm talking about strong bone Bavaria. You know what I mean? That's how different we are. I'm leaving the restaurant going, this is never going to work. She's like on another galaxy for me. You know what I mean? We are in such a, we feel that we are in such a lifestyle change with everything that we have done. I mean, she's biology major. She, like, she's done so much stuff at uni and stuff and everything that we have worked for our whole lives is to this point just changing and we're changing it for what we see as being a, a bit more of a lighter life, a bit more of a, a freer life. And some of my friends are like, you're living in this million dollar house and you're living like millionaires. And we're like, yeah, that might be the case, but we want to live like billionaires. We want to go out and we don't want to have to do stuff. If we want to go out and live in a field for two weeks, then that's what we're going to do. You know what I mean? We don't. That's just where our heads are at, man. You know what I mean? Like, it's crazy. I hope, you know? I really hope that through doing this over this next load of months or whatever, that whatever you're craving, that you fulfill that. And I really hope that it makes your music so incredible. And I really wish you every single bit of success going forward. You have had an incredible journey. You've just turned 40. And there is so much more still to come. No, I still have to get the little talk, so Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, open, thank you for being so honest. Thank you for telling me. And I said to you at the start, I've been waiting to do this for, for so many years and it didn't it didn't disappoint. We ran over time massively. It's a good um, one. and and uh, and you you have lived out so many people's dreams and um and you've had fun along the way you've had hardship along the way you've had good times you've had bad times you've had times when you've probably been thinking to yourself how did i get here what the heck is going on but you know what you survived it and you're still here to tell the tale and that yep. my friend, is incredible very lucky thank you mate appreciate it and um come back home in the next chapter written won't you I will do, yeah, Jesus. I will look great after that. <laughs> Waiting for my moment. I just can't catch my breath. I just can't catch my breath. I just can't get enough. Just can't get enough I hit me in my eyes to find the key Fairy tale